Well, for those of you who don't think about ancient Rome every day, like I do, uh, emperor and philosopher Marcus Aurelius gave some great advice to public officials. In a bit of a laundry list, he said, keep yourself simple, good, pure, saintly and plain, a friend of justice, God-fearing, gracious, affectionate, and strong for your proper work. Life is short, and the fruit of this life is a good character and acts for the common good. And the same can be applied to public servants today. And while it may seem hard to find political role models in today's uh, day and age and in our environment, there are some in our midst. And today I'm, I'm honored to introduce former Governor Doug Ducey, who has many well-deserved claims to fame. He's a husband, father of three, past chair of the Republican Governors Association, and of course, the former two-term governor from Arizona. While in office, he was battle-tested, uh, and he emerged with his integrity intact, and he demonstrated himself to be a tireless champion of freedom and of liberty. But perhaps his greatest accolade, at least according to Twitter, is apparently being Shoshana Weissman's son, something I think we all have a lot of questions about. But with that aside, without further ado, I bring you Governor Ducey. Thank you, Mark, very much for that introduction. And it's really an honor to be here with you all today. I want to begin by thanking R Street uh, for today's invitation and for all that you've done to be a leader in good public policy at the state level. When I think back on our eight years in office in Arizona, we were able to get some of the biggest policy achievements over the finish line. And I want to thank this, our Street Institute, because I really do believe it's the relentless work and advocacy that you've displayed, especially when it came to universal recognition of occupational licensing, the first state in the nation to pass that law, and now it's been replicated coast to coast. You've all been real partners. And I want to give a special thanks to Shoshana Wiseman. <laughs> I don't refer to her as mom, I call her senator. Uh, she's been a real ally and a friend. She's fun to work with. Her passion and enthusiasm are infectious. So I wanna say thanks Shoshana for all that you do. I didn't start my career in politics or government. I sold ice cream for a living. I was the CEO of Cold Stone Creamery, and I actually didn't come to this town until I was 45 years old. There's a lot of history in Washington, D.C., and a lot of sacredness in this place, especially in our monuments and the United States Capitol. But I can say with confidence that one of the best things about being a governor in this country is that you don't live or work in Washington, D.C. You live and work with the people that actually elected you, and you're around them quite a bit. So whether you run into them at Costco, or your kids' hockey games, or when you're flying coach at a Sky Harbor airport, you learn a lot. I can honestly say I've never had a negative or hostile experience, but let me tell you, when you're picking out the rotisserie chicken at the grocery store, and a mom comes up to you to talk about their kid's school, and something they read in the newspaper, it's actually a really good way to solve the issue we're talking about today, decentralizing power and restoring trust in institutions. There's no hiding when you're a governor. You don't get to walk by a problem and grandstanding doesn't cut it when there's a wildfire or a flood or a budget that needs to be balanced. You're rightly expected to act and actually do something about it. You're expected to have a plan. And if you do the job right, you run on an agenda and you're held accountable for it. My agenda was pretty simple. Teach American civics in our schools. It's the same test that new immigrants take to become U.S. citizens. Provide 100% school choice, including universal educational savings accounts to every family. Drive Arizona's income tax as close to zero as possible. Eliminate and remove unnecessary regulations, and in the process, build our economy and shrink our government. 
The first one, American Civics, actually came pretty easy. We got it done the first week in office, and it, believe it or not, this was 2015, actually unified the left and the right. The rest of the agenda, not so much. It took eight years, and the formation of unexpected allies, really ignoring the no noise, and yeah, oftentimes meant ignoring the media and the business elites. And then actually having the will to get it done. And we got them all done. That's where, when we look at our federal government and its leaders, we find ourselves dispirited in doubting their ability to solve the looming issues before us. $33.5 trillion in debt, a border that needs to be secured, a resurgent China, terrorism, war, and suffering for our great ally Israel, and a growing administrative state that is stifling freedom and free enterprise. When I come to this place or watch cable news, sometimes I think our leaders have forgotten why they came here in the first place. I think many people are asking, are we capable of self-government? It's worth reminding ourselves the point of winning elections isn't just to win the election. It's to govern with freedom-based principles and to preserve the American dream and improve the lives of everyday Americans. So how do we get back on track and restore trust? It's been said that if you want to learn something new, read something old. Truth is, it's right in front of us. President Reagan reminded us in his first inaugural, the federal government didn't create the states. The states created the federal government. Reagan intended to curb the size and influence of the federal government and demand recognition of the distinction between the powers granted to the federal government and those reserved to the states or to the people. And that's the path. The federal government tries to do too much and does most of it poorly. Madison wrote in Federalist 45, that the powers granted to the federal government should be few and defined. Those granted to the states should be numerous and indefinite. Reagan understood that. Most governors today understand it. In fact, on both sides of the aisle. Yet many in Washington, D.C. do not. Imagine if our national leaders focused on a few key things like defending the nation, securing our border, a coherent foreign policy while enforcing the law equally and reforming our finances and social safety net to allow for continued opportunity and leave the rest to the states. For nearly a century, the seizing of power from the states to the federal government has been unrelenting. Congress and the President have continuously usurped authority the Founders would have thought belonged to the states or the people. And in the last two decades, as Congress has become largely dysfunctional, more and more, it's been by executive order and the regulatory agencies, what people call the administrative state, that have taken over. And all the time this was happening, the third branch of government the judiciary largely sat by and let it happen. They called it judicial restraint, and it was celebrated by governors, presidents, and congressmen. I believe this court, as currently constituted, that's going to shift, and shift noticeably and abruptly. For the first time in nearly a century, I believe the Supreme Court is going to engage in judicial engagement. The act of actually judging. Because it is the third branch that decides what the Constitution actually means and what is ultimately unconstitutional. I believe they will act decisively to rein in the regulatory leviathan that threatens to strangle growth, opportunity, and individual liberties in this country. All you have to do is read the Wall Street Journal editorial page and you can see the lineup of federal agencies that are about to get spanked 
slapped down and reversed. The Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice, the Department of Labor, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Education, all are likely to lose high profile cases in the next several years that will fundamentally change the balance of power within our own government. Justice Lewis Brandeis called the state's laboratories of democracy. He said a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. Competition among the states is a good thing. We try different things and the outcomes are apparent to the voters. Best practices can be reapplied. Bad ideas can stop after one state unsuccessfully tries it. We have the perfect lab experiment happening out west. When I came into office in 2014, Arizona's economy was largely based on construction and call centers. Now I see value in all work, but I also knew we were better than that, that we could do more to diversify our economy and attract and open up to all businesses and industry, and not with giveaways or freebies. I always said when I was in the ice cream business, there was no tax incentives for chocolate dipped waffle cones. Instead, we reduced regulations, cut taxes, and reined in overzealous bureaucrats. Today, Arizona is a high tech hub of semiconductors, electric vehicles, and other innovative industries. Now, Ronald Reagan said, had the pilgrims landed on the west coast, they wouldn't have bothered to discover the rest of the country. Yet today, there is an exodus from the Golden State. And compare Arizona to California, which went down a much different path. Americans vote with their feet. And states like Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Arizona, and others that are following this winning playbook are seeing the results. And the problems facing our country reach beyond just our current federal government. The lack of principled leadership that is plaguing our institutions is also infecting higher education. Look at what happened over the last two weeks, shortly after one of the darkest days in Israel's history. Students from one of America's most elite institution, Harvard, released a despicable letter ripe with anti-Semitism, which blamed the Israeli victims for the despicable act of terrorists. Now, some of the original signers of that disgusting letter have since withdrew their support of the letter, but it wasn't because of the Harvard president's weak and belated statement. It was because of a tweet from Bill Ackman saying that he and other CEOs would never hire anyone so morally misguided that would sign on to that letter. And while many of our core institutions have suffered from a failure of leadership and moral clarity in recent years, bright spots still remain. America's free enterprise system has remained resilient and thriving over these years. Despite attacks from some of the very same decaying institutions that I've mentioned previously, the free enterprise system still serves as a beacon of hope and opportunity around the world. And Americans' entrepreneurial spirit has never dimmed. That's because free enterprise is more than just an economic system. It's the embodiment of the American dream. Despite being a catalyst for the creation of the greatest economy the world has ever seen, Free enterprise and capitalism itself faces threats from radical influences that fail to acknowledge the lessons of history. Some seek to tear down America's economic system and replace it with failed ideologies like socialism. We can't allow this idea to take hold in our culture. It's antithetical to who we are as Americans. 
If you hold up a sign in many of our college classrooms today, one that says capitalism and another that says socialism, it's about a 50-50 proposition. And that should terrify anyone who loves freedom. And that's why I decided to launch Citizens for Free Enterprise. I've witnessed it firsthand how free enterprise spurs innovation, builds up communities, lifts people out of poverty, and inspires entrepreneurship. Citizens for Free Enterprise will be at the center of the fight for free enterprise to promote opportunity, fight bureaucratic overreach, and defeat big government socialism. We've dedicated ourselves to being champions for economic freedom, be it in the heated debates in Washington, D.C., the legislative arenas in state capitals, or at the grassroots level, influencing elections that determine the direction of the country. So future generations will have even more opportunity than we do now. We cannot waver in this fight. In Reagan's Time for Choosing speech, he told us the story of two men talking to a Cuban refugee. We don't know how lucky we are, one man said to the other. How lucky you are, replied the refugee. I had some place to escape to. As Reagan put it, in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And it remains today. There's no place on earth we'd rather be or we wouldn't be here this afternoon. Most of us can say unflinchingly, while far from perfect, we remain the single greatest country in the history of the world. Now there's much talk about defending democracy these days. And that's all well and good. And that's worthy work. Yet we must remember that we are a constitutional republic, a form of democracy, one intended to distribute power broadly and specifically outside of Washington, D.C., from school boards to state houses. Ben Franklin quipped, a republic if you can keep it. I, for one, believe we will keep it. We must keep it. And if we can commit ourselves to the bedrock principles laid out in our declaration and constitution, we will be the ones to ensure it's protected. Thank you.